In this video, we'll take a look at the Heathkit IB1101 frequency counter. As I've covered frequency counters in more detail in other videos, here we'll just cover the features of this particular unit. The IB1101 could measure frequency up to 100 MHz. It was on the market from 1972 to 1975, and it was only offered as a kit. It typically sold in the U.S. for $199.95. It was one of a range of counters that were sold around the same period of time that included the IB1100 30 MHz counter, IB1102 120 MHz counter, and the IB1103 180 MHz counter. These models all used Nixie tube displays. Later models switched to light emitting diodes and eventually liquid crystal displays. The earlier IB101 was the first digital counter and the first Heathkit to use digital circuitry in the form of TTL integrated circuits. It was introduced in 1970 and was a 15 MHz counter. Also offered around the same time as the IB1101 was the IB102 175 MHz frequency scaler that would divide input by 10 or 100 to extend the frequency range of counters. It could be used with the IB1101, but was not particularly useful because it only extended it from 100 to 175 megahertz. The IB1101 is a five-digit counter that can measure frequency from 1 hertz to 100 megahertz. Accuracy is plus or minus one digit plus the time base error. Sensitivity is 50 millivolts RMS from 1 hertz to 50 megahertz, and 100 millivolts from 50 megahertz to 100 megahertz. It has ranges for both kilohertz and megahertz and uses gate times of one millisecond or one second depending on the range. The input impedance is one mega ohm shunted by less than 15 picofarad. The maximum input voltage is 250 volts RMS from zero to five megahertz decreasing to three volts RMS at 100 megahertz and it can take a maximum of 250 volts DC. It has an internal time base that, after about a 30 minute warm up, has a stability of plus or minus three parts per million from 45 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It can accept an external one megahertz frequency reference input of either 2.5 to 6.5 volts RMS sine or square wave. The front panel controls are very simple. There's a power on off switch, a megahertz kilohertz range switch, and a standard BNC input jack. The kit included a cable and probe. The frequency is displayed on five Nixie tubes and a light indicates whether it's on the megahertz or kilohertz range. The gate light indicates that the time base is operating. An overrange light indicates when the input exceeds the range which is 100 kilohertz on the kilohertz range or 100 megahertz on the megahertz range. The unit had a rotatable handle which is missing on this unit. On the rear panel we have the connector for the power cord. The TP output is a one megahertz oscillator that's used during calibration. The TP level adjustment provides access to a control to adjust the level of the TP output which is also used during calibration. The external standard input is for an external one megahertz time base if you have one that's more accurate than the internal time base. Time base oscillator provides access to the trimmer cap for calibrating the internal one megahertz time base oscillator. Input sensitivity provides access to a trim pot used during calibration to adjust the input gain sensitivity. This large TL3 case is the 5 volt regulator which is attached to the chassis as a heat sink and it gets a little warm during operation. Operation is very simple. You turn the unit on using the power switch. Ideally allow 30 minutes of warm up for maximum accuracy but you can use it immediately. Then select either the megahertz or kilohertz range. Connect the input to the frequency under test using the cable. Apply the input signal and read the frequency off the display. The gate light indicates that the time base is operating. Here we've got an input of about 30 megahertz on the megahertz range. The overrange light indicates that it exceeds the range, 100 kilohertz on the kilohertz range or 100 megahertz on the megahertz range. So with an input of 30 megahertz, we're overrange on the kilohertz range. Even when overrange, the display still accurately indicates the least significant digits. So you can use this as a method to make more accurate measurements of higher frequency signals by looking at the megahertz range reading and then switching to kilohertz and reading the less significant digits. So here we're seeing a frequency of 29.9721.
Let's take a look inside. Incidentally, one Heathkit catalog description I came across said that the unit could be built in approximately 10 hours. Inside you can see that most circuitry is contained on one printed circuit board. It's fiberglass, single-sided, and silk screened. All the parts are on the circuit board except for the switches, power transformer, fuse, and voltage regulator. It doesn't use any microprocessor or any LSI chips. Nothing more complex than TTL chips like decade counters and logic gates. It uses a 1 MHz time base using a crystal that was said to be temperature compensated and approaching the performance of a more expensive oven controlled crystal. You can also use an external 1 MHz input instead of the internal one. In all, it uses 11 diodes, 11 transistors, and 27 integrated circuits, one of which is the voltage regulator. The rest are TTL digital ICs. The ICs are socketed using very inexpensive sockets that are made up of individual pins. They came in a strip that was cut, and then after soldering you needed to cut off a piece that held the individual pins together. The display uses Burroughs Nixie tubes. I imagine they were also used for Burroughs calculators and maybe early computers. They are essentially neon lamps and run on about 140 volts DC. The range, gate, and overflow indicators are simple neon lamps. The front end circuitry is relatively complex using seven transistors before it goes to the first TTL chip. It includes circuitry to adjust the sensitivity and a Schmidt trigger. The kit originally came with the ubiquitous Heathkit nut starter, which was also used for adjusting the trimmers using a metal blade insert. It also came with an alignment tool and an IC puller. It even came with a spool of solder. The unit could be wired for 120 or 240 volts AC. The sticker on the back would be placed to indicate which voltage it was wired for. As well as the ICs, the Nixie tubes are socketed. It originally came with a shielded test lead with a BNC connector on one end and alligator clips on the other. The Heathkit manual is of the usual high quality with lots of diagrams, fold out pictorials, troubleshooting hints, and theory of operation. The unit could be aligned with an accurate signal source, another counter, or just with an AM or shortwave radio. Calibration could be done without instruments using a shortwave receiver tuned to station WWV and zero beating the counter, or an AM radio station using the fact that stations are multiples of 10 kHz. The sensitivity was then adjusted using the TP output signal on the back. To calibrate it with instruments, you could calibrate it against a known frequency counter or a generator which was used as a standard reference frequency. I bought this unit on eBay from a seller locally here in Ottawa, Canada. As received, it appeared to be working. It came with a line cord that was not original, this one here, and the cord was glued to the cord socket using silicone caulking. I replaced the power socket with a standard IEC connector shown here. I had to cut a larger opening in the case and add two holes to mount it. The previous cable also didn't have a ground, although the original one did. The new cable is grounded. Originally there was a five position tilt stand handle which is missing from this unit. I actually have a number of Heathkit frequency counters and they're all missing the handles. I noted that the date codes on the ICs ranged from 1972 to 1974, which is consistent with these being original parts. Most of the ICs are common TTL gates with the exception of the 75 450, which is a dual peripheral driver. There's a US amateur radio call sign engraved inside the top cover, as well as some initials on the chassis, which I could just make out. These match the ham radio operator who's been active since 1966. I found his email address and actually contacted him, and he vaguely remembered building this unit, but didn't know any of the history or how it might have ended up in Canada. He's located in Florida. I can imagine a Canadian ham may be spending the winter in Florida, picking the unit up at a flea market, and bringing it back home. There's a rather obvious modification that was done with an IC mounted on top of another one. Two of the original NAND gates of IC22, a 75450, were instead wired to two NAND gates from a 7400 mounted on top. It's not entirely clear why this was done. It could have been a bad chip, or maybe it was marginal, or the design didn't work up to a high enough frequency. I do note that the propagation delay of a 75450 is about 20 nanoseconds and for 7400 is about 10 nanoseconds.
There's some additional modifications done to the front end circuitry on the bottom of the board. There's some additional resistors and caps on the bottom of the board and one resistor on top. I didn't find any references to this modification ever being published. Maybe it extended the frequency response or improved the sensitivity. The date code on the extra IC indicated that it was likely done in the early 1970s. I ran through the calibration procedure for the input time base and sensitivity. The time base adjustment was pretty much bang on. The unit didn't come with a manual and I wasn't able to find a full manual on the internet. So I took a look on eBay and was able to buy an original manual. This one is dated 1972. I also found an interesting article in the November-December 1975 issue of 73 magazine called Updating the Heathkit IB1101. It describes some modifications to the unit to make the sampling period adjustable in six steps. It requires adding a small circuit board with two ICs and a six-position rotary switch. I have some other Heathkit frequency counters, the IM2410, IM2420, and the IM4100, and I've made some YouTube videos about them that you may want to check out as well. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're interested in Heathkit test equipment, you may be interested in purchasing my book, Classic Heathkit Electronic Test Equipment. It's available from Amazon and Lulu.com.